Hey, it's Alan, and I just wanted to let you know that you can now listen to the ongoing history of new music early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. This is Matthew Good on, uh, well, Matthew Good. I'm, I'm one of those people that uh, I carry a lot of guilt for a lot of things around. I mean, even to this day, even given all the problems, you know, like was it me? Was it w- w- was the fact that I had an illness that was that the reason the band broke up, or was you know, or or was I difficult, or did I was I characterized as difficult in the media, or or with people that work for me because of that reason? Th- those are things that I that, that do cross my mind, and that I do admit could you know definitely be a, a possibility and played a role in those things. And to deny that would be ignorant. This is the unvarnished, uncensored, completely honest history of Matt Good, in his own words. This is the Ongoing History of New Music Podcast with Alan Cross. Matthew Good from his 2009 album, Vancouver. That's called Last Parade. Well, again, I'm Alan Cross, and this is another one of those programs where I get the artist to do all the work when it comes to telling their story. I've been wanting to sit down with Matt for a long, long time, and when we finally worked things out, we, he, had a lot to talk about. So this is Matt's story in his own words. Let's get going. Here at the end of 2009, we have 12 releases over 14 years. Mm-hmm. And a lot of people who have maybe jumped on the train somewhere in the middle didn't realize that you began as part of a folk band. Yeah, by accident. How by accident? Well, in, I guess at the very end of high school, I never sang before in my life. And some guys were in a folk band. And, uh, well, look, folk band, they played acoustic guitars. Uh, you know, we weren't doing Season of the Witch or nothing. But uh, they asked me if I could write some lyrics, and I said, sure. And uh, that turned into me singing, which I, you know, went home and listened to, like, bookends 40 times and just mimicked it and thought, good enough, okay, here we go. So I did that, and that slowly progressed into that band becoming somewhat of a kind of a rock band, and I just sang again, right? And then... When I was 20, I picked up a guitar for the first time. And I taught myself about four, four or five open chords. And I just started writing songs. I didn't really learn anyone else's songs. I started writing, you know, it was just simple E minor C, E minor C, 19 verses. You know, <laughs> well, I mean, I, I'm, a, I'm a, you know, I'm a Dylan maniac, so it, you know, that's the way it was, right? So I would do that, and then I started doing some demos with, uh, you know, uh, an acquaintance at the time and trying to expand some stuff. And, you know, at the time, of course, you think it's great. You look back at it now and, you know, you think, holy shit, was that bad? But that's really how, how I started in it. I went to school briefly for fine art, actually. Um, and uh, kind of given the economic climate of the time and where my family was at, I, I dropped out of school, went back and got a job and uh, to help out. This would be, what, late 80s, early 90s, right? Yeah, it'd be really, really early 90s. Because that was a brutal recession. That was really bad back then. Well, yeah, I mean, I was on welfare, I guess, for six months at some point, I think. And it was really interesting, you know, because you're in line on a Wednesday morning in Port Moody, and, and uh, you know, I was member of standing in front of a woman, and I ended up putting my coat over her, her baby because she had a stroller but no top over top of the job. You know, and her husband had left her, and she was in the house, and she had no money, no food, didn't know what to do, wasn't from British Columbia, she was from like Nova Scotia or something, uh, and no family. And, uh, you know, so it was like her last resort. And you saw a lot of people like that. It wasn't just, you know, drunkards and, you know, it was actual people who couldn't get a job. The job I found after that, I worked at a gas station from 5.30 in the morning till you know, five o'clock at night, and I was damn lucky to have it, you know? And actually, I wrote the lyrics to 
I would have uh, wrote the lyrics to uh, Symbolistic White Walls on a, some of the, like the first verse of that song. I wrote it on a, a um, windshield uh, piece of paper towel. Yeah. Mm. And I'd use it like a couple of years later, but that's where I originally wrote it. Sometimes it never fails when I have a psychic and she says I'm loving. She says my destiny is turning out all wrong. Now I just sit here and think of Symbolistic White Walls from the Matthew Good Band. That was a single from the first proper album, Last of the Ghetto Astronauts, which came out in 1995. The whole thing was recorded for about $5,000, and there were no electric guitars anywhere. Everything we hear are acoustic guitars run through Marshall amplifiers. And Matt had blonde hair back then for a while, really. Now, there was an indie release before that. It was a cassette-only thing called 15 Hours on a September Thursday, which came out early in the fall of 1994. It contained a song called Last of the Ghetto Astronauts, which is where they got the title for their first album. Now let's get back to Matt and his story, specifically how this group ended up becoming the Matthew Good Band. So by the time we get to about 93-ish, we have the Matthew Good Band. Yeah, we have an incarnation of it. I mean, back then it was all different players. There were strings involved in it. And then in 93, that ended because I knew that I, I, I couldn't go any further with that. I just, it wasn't fitting where I wanted to go musically. But, but let's, let's just, I mean, you went from being a guy writing lyrics on a paper towel at a gas station mm-hmm. to instead of being in a band with a name like The Blanks or whatever, to being the title character in a band. I mean, that doesn't happen very often. Well, actually, to tell you the truth, it was, um, it, in that, in that regard, it, it was just, we were just using mostly my name um, because no one was really, you know what I mean? Like we weren't all kind of committed to, the, the players all had other stuff going on in the lives they were going to college and going to university and stuff. So when I made Last of the Ghetto Astronauts, when we did that record, everybody kind of came in as, well, Ian and Jeff came in as kind of committed to it. Dave was paid to play on that album. He was a session musician. And we were actually a three-piece. We weren't four-piece then. And um, what happened with the name was is that uh, we went out on tour, uh, because I don't know how many times we toured the country in a van, you know, playing 16 shows in a row with your knees pinned up against the seat in front of you. You know, that's when you sleep. You have a shower, maybe at whatever band room you're in or whatever, so... um, what happened, I can I remember vividly, we were in Thunder Bay, and we'd released the record, and if the, if you have, if anyone out there has one of the first 5,000 copies of that album, it just says MGB on it, mm. right? And uh, what happened was is that we got a phone call from the guy doing radio promo for us at the time, Bobby Gale, and he said, well, Alabama Hotel Room is like top 20 at radio, and uh, or top 30, and, I was, we were shocked. And he said, well, it's, we've kind of got a problem here. And, uh, you, know, he's, you know, people are calling in requesting it and calling it Matthew Gibbon. And same thing at retail, people were going in, you know, because we were independently distributing that record and they were going and asking for Matthew, the Matthew Gibbon. Now, at that point, I'm stuck between a rock and a hard place because as a band, we were having conversations at that point of changing it to a band name. But at the same time, you don't look, you know, you don't look a gift horse in the mouth, right? Mm-hmm. So the decision was made that that's what we would call it. And uh, that eventually we would just work more and more and more towards uh, using the, popularizing the acronym. So that's, you know, that was kind of the decision that was made. But unfortunately on that day, that was the beginning of the end too. Mm-hmm. Because from that day forward, ego was about everything. and. Be just because the band was named after me, there's nothing I can do about it, right? I, you know, I placated everybody as egos as much as I bloody could. You know, I gave out publishing to that shouldn't have been given out. I gave credit where credit shouldn't have been due. Um, just to try and keep the peace. Yeah, to keep everything going. Here's another single from Last of the Ghetto Astronauts. This is Alabama Motel Room. When the night-
Alabama Motel Room, the Matthew Good Band from 1995. More from Matt and his personal history coming up next. This is part one of Matt Good in his own words. Last of the Ghetto Astronauts was followed by an EP in 1997 called Ray Gun. It included a re-recorded version of a song from the first record. It's Haven't Slept in Years. Haven't slept in years. The Matthew Good Band and Haven't Slept in Years. That's from the Ray Gun EP, which was put out to buy a little time for the recording of the second album, which was called Underdogs. Here's Matt. Well, Underdogs, we were, I signed a record deal with Private Music, which was a BMG subsidiary in Los Angeles. And uh, we made the Ray Gun EP. And before, right when Warren lives, he, I originally wanted to do that record um, with Gil Norton. Hmm. And Gil, I had just finished playing some shows with The Who on the Quadrophenia tour in 1996. And Gil came out to one of those shows. So he had been doing the first Foo Fighters albums by that point? He, he was just about to do Color and Shape. Okay. And that's why he couldn't do it. Ah. He couldn't do the record because he was doing the food record and he'd already committed, but he really wanted to do it. You know, and every time I go to England, he's, you know, I, if I, he's, give me a call. You know what I mean? Mm. He's a fantastic man. And, um, you know, and I, what he did with the Pixies is, well, will always be legendary. Gone. Legendary. Mm. So um, he recommended using Warren, Warren Livesey, you know, who did Diesel and Dust and Blue Sky Mining by Midnight Oil. And for me, more importantly, Mind Bomb and Infected by the, the which, I mean, Mind Bomb alone. I mean, Two of the best sounding records ever. I mean, you know, Good Morning Beautiful is just like, so what happened with that was is Lives came over and private folded and they pulled the record the day we were start, supposed to start recording. But you see, I was lucky because I had signed a two firm deal with them. So basically through some legal finagling, I got them to pay me out on what they owed me for both records. So Without I- Without having to record anything? Yeah. No, not a damn thing. They had that's Malcolm McLaren territory. Yeah, I know. That's it. It's not bad. And so what happened? So I'm sitting there and I've got this money burning a hole in my pocket. So I basically spent it on making underdogs. So I paid for the record myself, and uh, Warren came back and produced it. And you know, it came out. Everything's automatic. Did what it did. Indestructible. Did what it did. You know, apparitions. I mean, well, that's see, that's where things kind of got interesting because you know there was an office bed at Universal or at A and M at the time. Polygram, what, who bloody knows what it was then? There was an office bed going around where the actual head A and R said that I wouldn't sell more than thirty thousand records. Right, positive, right? And uh, then apparitions kind of broke down with the video of that song. Me and Bill Morrison. Um, we were supposed to go down and film it. We had this other idea. We we're going to go down to Mexico during Cinco de Mayo, and we we're going to do it. And that got blown off because it didn't work out. So we came up in, I don't know, 36 hours with this idea to do it in the TD building in Vancouver. Mm -hmm. And that's what we did. We shot it in two days between 8 at night and 6 in the morning. And uh, when it was done, the record company looked at it and just said, this is suicide. No one will get this. But they delivered it to much anyway. And my record sales went from around 20 something thousand records to 100 and something thousand records, or 100 and thousand, you know, whatever records uh, in a matter of months. And, you know, that record, that, that song just catapulted that album and set us up for the next one. Matthew Good Band from Underdogs, released October 7th, 1997. Big single, Apparitions. Coming up next, Matt covers Depeche Mode. Yeah, and, and you gotta hear this. It's the panda story. This is brilliant, trust me. 
All right, before we move on to the next Matthew Goodband release, here's another single from Underdogs, the album that really put Matt on the map. This is Rico. The Matthew Good Band toured behind the Underdogs album for a couple of years before Beautiful Midnight was released in 1999. In between, though, was another EP called Lo-Fi B-Sides. Now, this might be new to you. It's the Matthew Good Band covering Depeche Mode. The Matthew Good Band from a quickie EP called Lo-Fi B-Sides, released in 1998. This brings us to the story of the Panda. In 1999, the Matthew Good Band played Edgefest, where songs from Beautiful Midnight, the third album, were road tested. That was the summer that ivory of is. the panda yeah that's the summer that <laughs> <laughs> do you want to tell the panda story or shall i you know what you tell it because you're like kind of an objective observer all right <laughs> matthew good band playing on the main stage at edge fest in molson park and barry for that particular performance, there were a number of characters that were invited on stage. I think there were some Argo cheerleaders. Yeah, the Toronto Argo cheerleaders started it off with giant. Yeah. A bunch of other people in costumes, including a guy in a giant panda outfit. Yes. Now, the guy in the panda outfit is this guy named Ivor Hamilton, who works at Universal Music. And he basically was looking after you a lot. Yeah, yeah, he's my marketing. Yeah, marketing guy. More, yeah. So Ivor is on stage, I don't know what song it was, I completely blanked out about that Everything's part. Everything's automatic. Everything is automatic. Ivor's on stage in this giant, he's got this big panda head on, and big panda paws, and big panda feet. And the stage is what, about 10, 12 feet high? Yeah, about that. Yeah. And they had the run with the, the run out. And they had the moat. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, but, but, but with the run out out front, remember? That's right. Right. So. Okay, so the kids who are down front, losing their mind, sees this panda and implore the panda to stage dive. That's right. So, it's late in the afternoon, chances are the panda, or whoever was in the panda suit had been drinking at this point, decide, <laughs> me, jump, me, jump, me. So, stands back, takes a run at the crowd, takes a big dive into the crowd, and the crowd parts like the Red Sea. Everybody moves. Panda, bam, face down on the ground, 12 feet below the stage. Yep. At this point, everybody in the crowd starts taking the boots to the panda. <laughs> and there is a picture. Well, I had to back up. because <laughs> The mic was back, right? I was out on the walkout. The mic's back out by the monitor <laughs> line, so I had to go back and start singing again. I didn't know what happened, Ivor. And all I remember is that we walked, that was the final song, we walked off stage, and he's sitting in the back rank with the bloody hood off, <laughs> and his nose is bleeding. Oh God! Because it was it was a football helmet that held up the big panda head. Yeah, I felt so bad. There's a picture we have someplace, and it's the panda trying to get up out of the crowd, and he's got his big panda hands over his panda eyes as everybody's yeah. kicking the crap out of him. Oh, it is no. the funniest thing I have ever seen no. in a show. You know, and the, the great thing about it is, is that, you know, in 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 2001, we re I released. Um, the, that EP loser anthems, yeah. and that's why I put the panda on, on the back, the back. <laughs> just to, to honor Ivor. <laughs> it was. It was fantastic. Yeah, oh, yeah. Sorry, Ivor, it's just the greatest story ever. Yeah, it and, is. And you're part of it the part, part of this. Yeah. Matthew Goodman with Everything is Automatic from the Underdogs album. We'll leave the final word on Matt Good to Matt Good. Let me just ask you one more thing. Sure. Do you ever look back at the stuff that you've done and go, wow, that was really awesome and amazing. I can't believe I did that. I'm so proud. Or conversely, what the hell was I thinking? I think I probably look back more and, and think what the hell was I thinking. 
I'm, I'm one of those people that uh, I carry a lot of guilt for a lot of things around, you know? Even to this day, even given all the problems, you know? Like, was it me? Was it was the fact that I had an illness that, was that the reason the band broke up? Or was, you know, or, or was I difficult? Or did I, was I characterized as difficult in the media or, or with people that work for me because of that reason? You know, th those are things that I that, that do cross my mind and that I do admit could, you know, definitely be a, a possibility and played a role in those things. And to deny that would be ignorant, right? I um, mean, you know, I wouldn't do it, so. Thanks to Matt for his time and thanks to Mike Sullivan for helping with the interview. Technical production for the Ongoing History of New Music is by Rob Johnston. I'm Alan Cross. You've been listening to the Ongoing History of New Music podcast with Alan Cross. Subscribe to the podcast through iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, Spotify, and everywhere you find your favorite podcasts.